get off me. Stop keeping me from my dreams. Ugh. Jesus Christ. Sorry, guys. I had to fight off the haters there to record this podcast. But what's going on? What's up? And welcome back to the X-Men Zinger Show, episode number 114. And if you're wondering what cuatro means, it means four. As I'm holding up these fingers to the bloody camera. Welcome back to the X-Men Zinger Show, episode number 114. With me, your host, Agostino. Welcome back. Thanks for joining me. How you doing? What's going on? Hope you guys are good. Right? I could be DW, innit? What's going on? on? Anyway, hope you guys are doing well. Hope you guys are well rested, well hydrated, well fed, and well looked after. Ah, how you doing, man? Sunny, sunny Wednesday afternoon. I'm here chilling somewhere in the depths of Maryland, Stratford. Um, talking to you lovely people on um, various other platforms such as podcast apps and the medium of YouTube. So wherever you're watching this, listeners to to this now at the moment, thank you for tuning in. It's a lovely day this this morning, you know, or this afternoon. I've had a nice, calm day, you know. I've had my day off this week, which has been lovely. You know, sometimes doing shift work is fucking annoying, but sometimes it's great because you get a little rest during the week. And you can do all your little life admin stuff, you know. I went earlier on today. I went to go pick up some shopping stuff, some salads and tomatoes and all that malarkey for me lunch this week. And I did some walking around, you know, looked at people walking around the street. I had my audio book in, you know. Tried not to get run over on the streets, you know. Ever since I've been subscribed to the subreddit called Watch People Die, which I recommend you do not subscribe to. But ever since I've been <laughs> I've subscribed to um, subreddit, I'm ultra, ultra vigilant when I cross the road. Like, like old lady vigilant. Like, sometimes I don't cross until I see the green man. And even then, I double check six or seven times like a fucking Iniesta on a traffic light. You know what I mean? Like, double checking. Not making checking my shoulders every single time. I'm so scared I'm going to get wiped out by some bloody, you know what I mean, Nissan Micra on the way to pick it up um, some romaine lettuce from Lidl. That is not the way to go out. <laughs> Imagine me splayed all over the cr- all over the floor in Stratford with some romaine lettuce on one hand and my iPhone reading an audio book um, from I don't know Aubrey Marx or something on my on my left hand. Not the way to go out. I don't want to go out that way. I want to go out in a blaze of glory. Do you know what I mean defending the honor of my um, wife and children in some way? Maybe that's the right way to go about it. But anyways, um, yeah, I've had a pretty. Um, constructive day so far i'm going to end the day with a long run i, I don't usually do runs on the, on the in the evening so it's going to be something that's out of my norm but today i woke up and i thought you know what let me get the podcast and all that stuff done out the way in the own morning or the afternoon and i'll do my extra stuff on the in the evening i'm not sure if it's going to work well i'm not sure if i'm going to be feeling very energetic but i'm going to do it anyway because i've committed to it i said it out in public so i'm going to go for like a five mile run in the evening later on today so that should be very very fun i'm looking forward to doing it um, apart from that, it's been a fairly decent week, man. You know, um, I've had some great news so far in terms of I haven't handed in my notice. So this role that I'm in at the moment is going to be winding on down at the end of the month. So I'm happy with that. You know, it's always good to close a chapter yourself, right? Um, it's weird, isn't it, employment? Because in general, right, for the most part, I'm trying to do my own thing in the hope that I'm able to sustain myself through the creativity of my own hands. But if that doesn't work out, I'm going to start flipping stuff and just, you know, making making money that way. But by and large, I kind of have aspirations to, you know, I have aspirations or I have a dream or I have a yearning, right, um, to pay rent doing the things that I want to do, right, in general. Even if it means flipping stuff, I want to do what I want to do. I don't want to, someone to take up my time. So, even with that being said, there is a little bit of pride and a little bit of a pat on the back involved with when you decide to leave a place of work on your own accord. When you decide, you know what, I've had enough of this place. I want to go somewhere new or I want a different challenge or I just want a, di- a different change of, or, di- or just a different change of scenery, right? Um, I've long held the assumption, I've long held the view that a lot of people that are employed, especially within my age range, I don't know, let's say like 25 to 32, they're incredibly ungrateful for what they have, right? They're always kind of looking over the fence and, you know, thinking the grass is always green on the other side. They or they kind of have uh, really the, the disillu- they're, 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 they're really disillusioned. They're, they're really uh, disillusional disil- about where they are in terms of their career arc, right? They think they should be further along when they're really right at the beginning of their career. They overestimate their... Um, talent, they overestimate their skill, they overestimate their um, work ethic, um, and they feel entitled to things that they shouldn't really be feeling entitled to. 
So because of that, you end up with a lot of moaning, a lot of whinging in most workplaces. Like I guarantee you, even the most um, well-heralded workplace, like let's say like a Monzo, right? Everyone loves Monzo. Everyone uses that app. Even I don't, I don't use it myself, but everyone's always kind of rabbing on about Monzo. I love to, I love to shit on Monzo because everyone uses it. Everyone's got that fucking fluorescent pink card that you use. Do you know what I mean? Fuck off. So whatever, everyone loves Monzo, right? But I'd imagine there's people like the Monzo office, uh, police cars going around there in Maryland. Nothing new there. Um, I'd imagine there's people in that Monzo office that are, you know, moaning about this or that, moaning that the CEO isn't doing this, moaning that the marketing department ain't doing that, moaning that the sales department ain't doing this. I'm sure there's a contingent in Monzo that, you know, every day for them is just, a, every day for them is just another dagger in their eye, right? But again, I'm not opposed to moaning because I think sometimes, um, your feet, even though I think feelings can be overrated, right? They can, you can um, over rely on feelings and try to use the feelings as a kind of a, a way to navigate through life, which isn't the best way. I, I do appreciate that sometimes, you know, you can be working somewhere and it couldn't, and it can, it can start off with good intentions. It can start off well, it can start off well meaning, but then it can kind of div, dissolve into an absolute catastrophe. I can get that happen, right? I can get that. I totally understand that. But the only problem that I have with some people, right, that moan and groan about the jobs that they have is that by and large, every job that you, you know, an adult, a grown adult has, especially if you're working in a, in a place and you don't have any dependents, you know, you might be living with a partner, but you don't actually have like a, a child or anything. I think for the most part, most jobs are interchangeable, right? They're not that serious. And you can, if, if, it, if, if it is as bad as um, your moaning is illustrating, then there is a possibility you could just leave, right? You could just go somewhere else. But people don't tend to do that because for the most part, people are, you know, quote unquote pussies in that regard, right? They don't want to take that jump. They're afraid of making a leap. They're not sure if their skills are going to match up anywhere else in another, in another industry. Um, they, Because I think moving to another, moving jobs, especially when you've been at one place for a long time, it's a real wake up call to exactly where you are in terms of like um, the hierarchy of potential um, employees, right or the higher hierarchy of potential candidates you get to see exactly where you are very very quickly because when you start sending out cvs and you start getting no's 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 you get to gauge that oh even though i've been at this company for three years my cv doesn't really show that i've developed in those three years it just shows that i've kept this job for three years and sometimes it can be a detriment to your um, future career prospects so for those people out there who love to moan who love to bitch and complain about the job that they have be grateful that you somebody's giving you a job for them for the most part right because you know as plentiful as jobs are in london because i think for the most part london even if you're somebody i think if you're somebody that's quite humble and you don't necessarily um get a lot you don't necessarily go to jobs for a sense of pride or to fulfill or to give you a sense of meaning right you're not um looking to work at a marketing marketing agency or to work in some fancy startup because you want the tote and you want to name drop the place that you work at a bar. If you don't really care about that kind of thing, I think in London you can find a job literally working in any industry that you want. Um, you can work your way up. You can take two steps backward and take a pay cut, um, take a responsibility uh, downgrade. Whatever you want to do in London, you can find your way around. You can kind of navigate it around. It can it can kind of result in you taking a few sideward steps, you know, a few backward steps. But by and large, you can get to where you want to get to, especially if you're not that fancy. But for those people that are fancy, or for those people that want ex want more, expect more, if you do and want to expect more, your actions have to back up your complaints. If you're complaining all the time, do put put some um, back up your complaints and put some action involved in it. Draw up a list of places that you want to go to, a little hit list, and start applying. But don't wait until the weekend. Don't wait until next week. Just do it now. But people don't do that. Why? Because they're pussies. And because they love having the job, they love picking up a check, and they don't want to throw that into jeopardy or risk um, maybe not getting a job and then or moving somewhere and it's not as good as you hoped it was. That's why you have to kind of rein in your complaints. Like, look at it objectively. Step away from yourself a little bit. And people are incapable of, incapable of doing that unless it comes to fucking celebrities, right? When it comes to celebrities, everyone's got an opinion. Everyone's got some um, wisdom to impart. Everyone's got a point of view that they want to share, right? Um, I would have done it like this. Oh, I can't believe she done that. Blah, 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 blah. But when it comes to your own life, motherfuckers, what do you do? Eh, nothing but complain. Nothing but complain. It's mad, isn't it? It's absolutely mad. Honestly, it really, really does. It really makes me laugh. But also, I have so much sympathy for people that start their own thing and have to look for employees because 
as I've learned over the years of reading um, various um, entrepreneurial books or following various entrepreneurial figures or listening to various people talking on interviews about setting up their business, it seems like the hardest thing to do is to hire those first, you know, three to five employees because they're going to set the tone for your company culture going, you know, for years to come, right? They're going to set the kind of, they're going to lay the foundations of how your company culture is company culture basically evolves oh obviously you can you're gonna fine tune it along the way but those first three to five hires are really 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 important and if you get in a bunch of crybabies a bunch of whiners that you know that don't see how lucky they are to have a job how lucky they are to work in your company how lucky they are to have the opportunity to work in a startup or a small business that's from that's working its way from the ground up right they get to take on loads of ownership they get to um see the results of their hard work directly it doesn't have to go through a chain of command right they're not appreciative of the things instead they're just complaining about the things that they don't have yet right and it's just like god almighty and most of the things that people complain about some of them are warranted right some of them have a lot of basis in it some of them have uh some sort of credibility but for the most part it's just like frivolous things that people are complaining about and most of them especially if it's like workplace conditions if it's like a thing of like i hate my manager i hate the people i work with like my team you can just move teams, right? You could try and apply to a mover team, especially if you're working within a company. Sometimes they want to. It depends what company you work for. Sometimes they want to fob the figures, right? They don't want to. They don't want to. They don't want to have the. They don't want to have figures that show that a lot of people leave, right? They don't, don't want to show like a high turnover. Sometimes companies to fob those figures would rather keep you in a team. Would rather keep you in a company, moving to another team, and give you, I don't know, a kind of token role than have you leave. Or in some instances, if you're really good at another, another, another aspect of the job or it may be on another aspect of the of the role that you're doing you can just take yourself away from the team and concentrate on that kind of like sub role so there's loads of things that you can kind of do in the interim for when you're complaining and then that will maybe ease a little bit of your anger a little bit of your frustration but in, a, in again in the long run in my opinion like what i honestly think i think people complain too much i think there's way too many complaints and most of them are and most of them don't really have any basis really for the most part um you know i've i came from I came from working in retail where like, you know, it's a flipping, it's a flipping flip of a coin um, in terms of working conditions you're going to be in. It's a real flip of a coin. You know, one time you could be working with the greatest manager in the world and the greatest team. Next moment in the, in a, you know, in a flick of a, in a flick of a wrist or, you know, or snap of the fingers. In the snap of the fingers, do you say that? Snap of the fingers? I think you said that, right? Uh, in a snap of the fingers, all of a sudden that manager gets um, headhunted by another division of the company, or they get taken to another part, um, or they get ta- or they get taken to another store. You know, because usually in retail, retail, I think they're a lot better at recognizing talent than probably I'd say office environment that's again just coming from anecdotally from my own experience. I'd say so. I think when you're a killer in retail, for the most part. Um, um, in what you call it the retail managers whoever they may maybe or the head of retail or regional managers and stuff they recognize quite quickly that you're really good at what you do and they will take you and they'll kind of allow you to kind of grow whether it's opening other stores whether it's becoming an assistant manager in another store whether it's opening a store whether it's helping out in merchandising they're really good i think in retail recognizing talent even before you say anything um, I think that's why I mentioned, I think the other day to somebody that I never heard of a performance review until recently, right? Um, for the most part, I think most of the stars I worked in probably didn't have them or maybe I came just after they did them. I don't know what happened, but the first time I've heard of a performance review was uh, quite recently. But in retail, I never heard of a performance review, right? For the most part, if you were doing a good job, you just get, you, you got given more responsibility. And then it was kind of, the onus was on you to kind of request um, a change in salary, maybe a change in title, and and sometimes if you're lucky and you work for a good manager, they would um they would kind of give the opportunity to kind of do a trial run of you kind of managing a store, opening, closing, cashing up. And then if you showed um good ability, if you showed that you had um, the good acumen for it, a good temperament for it, then you were given a position. It was quite easy to do. Um and for the most part, your lieutenants or the people that are working on the shop floor assistants, they kind of all fell in line because for the most part, the good thing about retail, because a lot of the people 
working in retail are usually people that don't want to hang around for long, especially on the shop floor. People are not managers. They don't really want to stay there for ages. They don't really want to have a career being a sales assistant, right? You don't really see hear people doing that too often. If you do hear of a career sales assistant, they're usually working in department stores where you kind of incentivize to sell things. So you're kind of more of a sales advisor as opposed to like a customer sales assistant or a sales associate. You might be on retail floor, right? In the department store, it's a bit maybe different. The incentive of making more money, um, plus they make much more money than a, a retail and a quote unquote retail staff that's working at size or something right he'd be making 750 or 850 an hour or whatever, whatever and then i think his counterpart if it was a girl working in a department store could easily make a grand extra on top of whatever she's making uh, monthly just for on commissions so that you can maybe make more of a career but if it's just like a general um working in a retail store whatever maybe on a shop because everyone's there, it's not there for a lifetime. They generally kind of fall in line. It's easier to kind of manage them. Maybe you kind of have some problems with weekend stuff. You can kind of be a little bit, you know, loosey-goosey and don't really give a fuck. But for the most part, they recognize talent easier. But I think maybe maybe because you're sitting on your ass a lot in in the office environment and you have so much time to think. And because you, by and large, I think in a retail environment, if, especially if you're working in a on a busy street with... Um, with a really, really high, what do you call it? Is it footfall or like um, passing traffic, right? Passing trade. Like those people um, in front of the store, like people coming in at all the time. You're busy from the opening until close. There's no time to really think and bother about the minutia of the job that you don't like, right? You just kind of get on with it and quickly do it so you can go home. But maybe because, again, I'm hypothesizing here, but maybe because you're in the office, you're sitting down in a chair for eight hours. For the most part, you're seated. Um, you don't really work the whole seven hours, right? Especially if you're working a job that requires you to do a set number of emails or a job that requires you something that's, that's um, quantified, right? It, it depends how quickly you do it. If you do it if, if you do it in four hours, your job is effectively done in four hours. Even if you're working on social media, right? If you if you ha if you happen to do all your con all your social media content posting um, for the day um, within the first three hours, effectively your job is kind of done. So. It allows for, you know, an idle mind kind of is going to wonder, right? So maybe that can then, maybe in that instance, you start, you know, making up all these weird sort of theories in your head about why you're not doing this and you start creating these enemies that don't really exist. I don't know. But in general, I think the office environment is fairly weird. I think in general, like I think if anyone has worked full time nine to five will know that the office environment is very weird. Um, in general, people are just, just weird in general. Um, there's, um, there's a tendency to complain. There's a tendency to kind of present one face and then have another face on the outside. Um, and there's also a tendency to kind of, again, to to maybe expect, they expect too much maybe as well from a workplace, I reckon. There's a little bit of that as well, right? To fill a void that you're longing to fill, right? And you want the workplace to kind of occupy that, which is a bit disturbing. Um, again, again, people have their own motives and stuff. But again, it's nice to be in a position where I'm able to move off my own accord, right? It's better than getting fired, I can tell you that. Um, so it's nice to be able to move off my own accord. But in another way too, I'm not, again, I'm, I'm happy and I'm, I'm really grateful that I'm, I've got an opportunity to do another job that's going to give me a more better responsibility or bigger responsibilities. That's going to give me maybe more scope to grow. It's going to give me uh, ultimately more money. Um, so, and that's going to probably be more favorable in terms of the, the shift patterns. I'm going to go back to doing a nine to five instead of doing shift work, which is going to be great. But, you know, there is a part of me that isn't super proud of it because in the end, I kind of want to do my own thing. But again, it's not being super proud, but it's not, it's not like I'm jumping for joy and punching the air and hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm really, really grateful that I've got one because I'm sure there's people out there that don't have jobs that they like or the people that don't have jobs in general. So I'm happy I have it, but I'm not going to be doing backflips. Do you know what I mean? Like, not yet. Until I do my own thing, until I'm able to, you know, flip stuff or uh, sustain myself with DJing or creative stuff that I'm doing outside of all that stuff, malarkey, whether it's writing or art or whatever it may be, until I'm able to sustain myself via the sweat of my own hands, right? Or the sweat of my brow. Remember that's the saying, right? Um, then I won't be, ultimately, I won't be that chuffed un until that happens. But again, like I said, work environment's weird. If you're complaining about stuff and you hate where you're working and it's not for you and you don't like your employees, you don't like your managers or whatever it may be or the company culture, I implore you, leave. Do everyone a favor and leave because um, that that kind of like um, moody, mopey attitude, it only goes to, it only brings down the people at work who don't mind doing the work, right? Who don't mind coming in, having some free coffee, getting a free pizza here and there, having some free drinks on the Fridays. People that don't, it's people that don't mind doing that. 
that love having a job and just being able to have that security of having a paycheck every single month right of working in a company that's fairly decent that has a really great company culture and you can go out with people that you work with and you're friends with them right it's people that don't mind that sort of thing and i think you do them a disservice by coming in and moaning and bitching and complaining right some people don't mind ha working and if you are working at the place that you're working at so if you, and if you don't and if you do mind working there then leave do them a favor and leave like let them have their fun it's, it's 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 akin to the person that's complaining that people watch X Factor. Oh, how many people watch this shit? Okay, they do. Get over it. Now, if you don't like it, just let them watch it. Leave the room. Do you know what I mean? Like, go somewhere else. Put your headphones in. Wherever it may be. I think people don't do that enough. There's too much... Um, there's too much of there's too much um what's that thing called there's too much uh projecting of, of feelings do you know what i mean and let everyone know how you feel in that moment it's like not everyone needs to know you know like keep it yourself be a grown-up and live but yeah so i'm happy that's happening in the next few weeks i've got a, i'm gonna finish off the time that i'm at my present place and i'm gonna move to my new place within the next few weeks by the end of the month actually so that should be an interesting challenge talking about old workplaces i'm not sure this news hasn't been out on the public i'm not sure if i should be talking about this but fuck yeah supposedly i've heard that my old employee uh mastered um an online learning platform similar to a u.s company a u.s company called master which i'm sure you might have seen on online it's not to be confused that company is called mastered the u.s company was called master um but it's the same sort of uh um, kind of idea it's an online learning platform where you get to learn from key figures within the fashion industry as opposed to master who kind of specializes in all different genres from filmmaking to tennis uh, to cooking whereas on master it was mostly fashion based so mostly based on um i think they did a bit of menswear did a bit of fashion did a bit of sorry did a bit of menswear did a bit of makeup photography and other bits and bobs um, it hasn't gone as well as they hoped, hence why the company is shutting down. I've heard that they've let go of most of the company and kept a quote-unquote skeleton uh, company in order to kind of um, deliver the last bits and bobs of the programs that they have available now at the moment. And once those programs have ended, there won't be any new enrollments for the new year and the company will cease to exist. So it's complete. It's really sad, of course, for me personally, because I used to work there. Um, it's a sad way to end the story. I thought when it first started that it was a really great um, idea. I think it was a great proposition to kind of shake up the fashion industry. I'm not into the whole disrupting, disruptor thing, because I think it's a little bit overused, a little bit, a little bit, um, what you call it? There's a little bit uh, uh, over romanticized. But I do think at the time it was launched and with the infatuation that the fashion industry has with the idea of students going to fashion schools and learning that way and the fact that there's been this big friction between um, streetwear designers such as Virgil Abloh who are coming from an out, the outside of fashion institutes or fashion, um, the quote-unquote traditional fashion education and coming in and leading storied or luxury fashion houses like Louis Vuitton and stuff, whatever. There's a big friction or conversation going on with that. I think Master was a great, was a great sort of like, serves as a great platform to illustrate that serves as a great sort of beacon to show that yes there are people out there especially who live outside of the main metro of the main kind of cultural cities of the world like the new york london tokyo's and shit who want to participate in this fashion movement but don't have the means to don't have the means or the, the ability to go and move to another city but learning online especially um picking up various skills not learning entirely how to like cut and sew online or whatever it may be but learning the basics and then kind of taking that and applying that to the stuff that they're doing it's really advantageous especially if you can do it from the comfort of your own home or studio so it started off really well but i think by and large the kind of issue that they had which a lot of startups have in general is that a lot of their success or a lot sorry a lot of their a lot of masters um no your yeah, problem that most startups have i think in general is that they don't necessarily generate they don't actually make money right that's the problem they have they don't make money so they rely heavily on investment investments investing investment rounds are the way that they're able to keep the lights on pay their employees and ultimately pay the talent that they're going to hire or that they're going to yeah they're going to hire on their platform in order to kind of you know promote their product or promote their service so because fundamentally startups don't actually make money and it's all just a it's all kind of it's a bit like um it's all a, it's all a, it's all like a ploy it's not a ploy but it's all like a kind of a marketing scheme in a way right you want to showcase your ability to kind of grow a company quote unquote um to kind of deliver a product or a service but unless the actual idea of making money like a small business doesn't really exist in startup land for some reason i'm not sure why but it's not a thing so because of that mastered relied quite heavily on investment i kind of was a bit 
dubious of the whole investment thing because you know there's a lot of celebration that happened when investment was secured the investment process itself having looked at some of the founders when they used to go and have meetings you could see the look on their face when they came back or when you saw them on a monday you could tell that this person had a slept for three days and they were up all night looking for investment it's a really really harrowing if you heard anyone speak about it, the process of trying to secure investment it's not fun it's not fun you know what i mean long fucking hours uh sending many many emails being on skype calls calling in general texting reaching out to people is very very emotionally and physically draining so that whole idea behind coming back and then saying oh we secured the bag we got this investment we still have another year and whoopity whooping it and drinking champagne and prosecco i always thought it was a bit strange and i thought that was a wrong way to that's a wrong metric to to gauge if a company is being successful right the fact that you're able to secure investment again in order to pay wages sometimes our wages will get paid late i'm sure some of you startup people would know have worked in startups like that's kind of a general thing that happens in quite a lot of startups where cash flow isn't um the best right so um payment is always delayed and stuff which is not good right if you're running a, a big business you sh if you're running an actual functional business that shouldn't, be, that shouldn't be the way things are happening or going on but it's happened quite often and in general um it just wasn't it just didn't feel like they were going to ever make money the business the business plan or the the way the business was structured just didn't you know it just didn't call for making money but again i didn't think it was gonna you know go under i didn't think they were gonna cease to exist i didn't think it would be that bad but unfortunately you know um it seems like the bubble's bursting on a lot of these companies i'm hearing a lot of talk of rumors online of snapchat is supposedly uh close to coming to the to an end too in that regard as well do you know what i mean they're just burning through the money that they're, they're bit that was invested in them or the money they raised when they went uh, public on the stock market and i just think now we're kind of now reach in the same way in the same way that you're seeing a move uh, away from conventional kind of like big ticket, um, really obvious um, 1 million plus followers, influencers, right? You're seeing a move away from that into people moving into more to the micro influencer land, right? People with like followers from like 5,000 and below, right? Even lower, even kind of like 400, 500 followers, right? You're seeing a move away from those conventional people, brands going for those followers, going for micro followers, micro influencers, sorry. And you're seeing the same in business land where you're seeing all these companies that have been like, you know, um, running after investment, um, trying to go public as quickly as they can, raising, um, going on the stock market on the NASDAQ and doing that whole bell thing, right? You're seeing a move away from that and now, and it going t towards like uh, smaller kind of like, moving more towards the kind of small business platform right like i'm i'm a startup i'm operating more like a small business where it's like it's a team of we could we could we could grow the team of 20 but we're going to make you work with a team of 10 and then when we need 20 we will grow 20 but we're not going to do it just for the sake of it just because of perception we're not going to move to a brand spanking new office at the top floor of some building so we look like we're success right we're going to operate from this dormitory or from this garage for as long as we can and then we'll move later there's a there's an emphasis more on building actual business that makes money right as opposed to building a brand or something that looks shiny and crisp on social media but doesn't actually generate any cash doesn't necessarily serve anyone doesn't actually necessarily um answer a question or fulfill a need right and this thing and move away from that so again maybe gary v was right okay Vaynerchuk, maybe we're gonna see the bubble burst on a lot of these startups that just kind of run around trying to raise an investment and sell their company to the highest bidder hopefully that will happen and then hopefully the kind of you know realism can kind of come back into industry more and kids that are growing up and trying to become intra entrepreneurs can maybe reassess their ambitions and maybe say you know what i, do, I don't you don't need to become an entrepreneur like mark zuckerberg you don't need to make the fa the next facebook because you're probably not going to do that anyway you should just try to service a need you should try to look look for opportunities to try and service a need and grow a business around that a business not a startup an actual business that makes money be able to pay your friends do you know what I mean? That you work with or employees that you get in and that's it. That's basically what you should be able to do and try and repeat that, you know, go, try and repeat that year on, year out and try and grow incrementally year on, year out. But that, that basically should be it. So hopefully with that, that might be a change. But again, um, RIP Mastered, um, you are gone but not forgotten. Um, and talking about um, books and to, oh, talking about um, small businesses and stuff, I've been reading this book at the moment called... It doesn't have to be crazy at work, right? I'm reading it now at the moment on my iBooks. You can see here my phone. My phone's no point showing my phone because it's fucking cracked. But anyway, I'm reading this book called It Doesn't Have to Be Crazy at Work by Jason Fried and another dude called Daniel something, Harriman or whatever. But it's a great fucking book. Um, 
Jason Fried is the one of the founders of Basecamp. And he's written this book, which is kind of a great antidote to the things that you're hearing now or the things that you would hear nowadays on social. You know, the whole hustle mania, the whole put if you don't put in the work, you won't get the results. Uh, the whole idea that, you know, especially at work or especially in some offices or some workplaces, the kind of like unwritten rule where they want you to stay behind longer for no apparent reason, just to kind of like as a sort of like a, as a show that you can do it or you know, in they want to lump you with uh, last minute deadlines. I don't know, 20 minutes before you're about to leave. So you have to stay an extra hour. Loads of like really poor uses of time management in workplaces result in this kind of overbearing need to contribute more hours in a week when you don't need to do that, right? When you should be trying to get more out of the time you have available as opposed to putting more time in a day. And this book kind of like stresses that quite often, quite frequently. And I recommend that you definitely check it out if you're, um, I wouldn't say on the fence, but if you're kind of, thinking about uh, the things what was it yeah if you're kind of thinking about stuff in general because there's some really good quotes here um that i want to pick out and read out that really kind of struck home to me one of them is this one it says um working 40 hours a week is plenty plenty of time to do great work uh plenty of time to be competitive plenty of time to get the important stuff done so that's how long we work at base camp no more no more Less is often fi- no more, no more. Uh, less is often fine too. During the summer, we even take Fridays off and still get plenty of good stuff done in just thirty-two hours. It's amazing, right? So in the summer, there's they don't work on Fridays. Fucking insane. No nighters, no weekends, no we're in a crunch. So we've got to pull seventy or eight hours this week. Nope. All right, that was a really, really great um note there. I saved. What was the other one I went to show you? Da, da, da. Where, where did I get these notes at? Where are they? Here we go. Notes. Um, da, 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 da. If, you want, if you can't fit everything you want to do within 40 hours per week, you need to get better at picking what to do, not work longer hours. It goes back to the quote from this CrossFit dude, which I thought was really good in terms of workouts. He was like, oh, you don't need to get better workouts. You just need to work harder at the workouts you're currently doing, right? It says, you know, that kind of longing of like, I need to find this the best ab workout. I need to find the best squat workout. No, no, no. Just keep doing what you're doing at the moment. Obviously, do, make the tweaks you need to make, but try and work harder at the things you have now as opposed to trying to find a golden ticket that's going to answer your players later. And you see that a lot in workplaces too. Do you know what I mean? Like this, this overbearing need to kind of, aff- kind of um, sacrifice more of your free time in order to kind of do the, the work you need to do at work. It doesn't necessarily work because I'm, I'm always of the thinking that if you're, if you have a really good work-life balance at work, I think that your, your employees by and large do better work when they know they're not going to be called upon at every single week of the day, every single week of the year to kind of do overtime. They're going to be more, um, they're going to be more willing to contribute even before you've even asked to working all night as if need be, right? If the company needs those kind of uh, things to be done. But when you're requesting it all the time, it kind of loses its sort of like panache. It loses its kind of impact. Another quote here as well, it says, when you cut out what's unnecessary, you're left with no need. Oh, Jesus Christ, my reading out loud is horrible. Hold on. When, you're, when you cut out what's unnecessary, you're left with what you need. And all you need, to, all you need is eight hours a day for about five days a week. Which, of course, I totally agree. Let's find the other quotes here. That I liked. Da, da, da. Yeah, uh, companies pour gobs of money into buying or renting an office and filling it with desks, chairs, and or computers. Then they arrange it all so that nobody can actually get anything done. Modern day offices have become interruption of factories. Merely walking in the door makes you a target for someone else's conversation, question, or irritation, which is, you know. Which is funny because that was the thing I read the other day about an argument. There's an argument against open plan workspaces, right? Saying that they actually cause more distraction than collaboration, right? The, the hypothesis is that if you have an open plan workplace, then people from the sales team and the marketing team can communicate across, you know, across the room and share ideas and collaborate on new interesting things. But by and large, you know, the idea that you have no walls or you have no boundaries or there's no people section off in different places just encourages people to kind of pop by your desk and ask you a question whilst you're in the middle of doing some really hard work or whilst you're in the middle of trying to really think up, um, trying to think of some new ideas or things to do. Um, it's not necessarily the best thing to do. And I've, I've kind of long kind of felt that view 
which is why most people, especially even in even in big startups, most of the higher ranking officials do have some do have kind of a cubicle of some sort of some sort of like res, uh, area that's kind of reserved for them away from everyone else, which is you know um, something that lends to the idea of like you know they need to they need to have their own private time in order to kind of get the work that needs to be done. But I highly recommend you check that out. It's called cool. it Doesn't Have to Be Crazy at Work by Jason Fried. I've got it on an ebook here on my iPhone, but it's available, I'm sure, on all on all and all platforms that you can buy books from. And I've also reading at the moment Ernest Hemingway A Movable Feast. This book right here. Um I'm sure some of you guys who are who are um, English literature graduates have seen this book or have heard of it, but I, I, I think I read this in secondary school. I'm not sure. But I'm rereading this again and it's been a fucking amazing read. Um, Ernest Hemingway's quest or voyage uh, through the Parisian streets, drinking, eating and smoking and, you know, being a bit of a, a dilly. What's that thing called? Um, being a bit of a man about town in Paris is really nice. It's good Because I remember there's loads of um, there was loads of Parisian or loads of Paris tours. Um, based around this book right where people went around and kind of uh, went to all the different spots that i mentioned in this book um so it's got a kind of it's got a real big place in the in the literature culture that people have been really accustomed to but yeah it's a really great book there's a quote here i picked out that was that really struck home with me that i'm going to read out for your lovely people and it goes as follows and this is something that i've been thinking about quite a lot of recently actually um it goes you can either buy clothes or buy prints um, it's that simple. No one who is not very rich can do both. Pay no attention to your clothes and no attention at all to the mode and buy your clothes for comfort and durability and you have in you have the clothes and money you have the you have the clothes money to buy pictures. So again, you can either buy clothes or buy pictures. You can re you can replace pictures with anything else, right? That people are interested in or want to do in their life. Replace that with anything. Um, it's that simple. No one who is not very rich can do both. Pay no attention to your clothes and no attention at all to the mode. And buy your clothes for comfort and durability and you will have the clothes, money to buy pictures. Which is something, you know, again, um, I've long held the assumption, or I've long held the thought that, you know, you know, a lot of people say, I don't have the time to do this. I don't have the thing, the money to do that, blah, 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 blah. I think that's a convenient excuse that kind of does illustrate or does it is a really good indicator if that person's a loser or not. I, again, apologies for being brutally honest, but that's the truth in my opinion. Um, that you know, if you're somebody that kind of resorts to that excuse, then you you are a loser. Because I think in general, if you want to do something, especially if it's something that you're really passionate about, if it's something that you really want to go to something that you think is going to change your life right i've seen it recently the other day with the whole glastonbury festival ticket uh fiasco right uh glastonbury festival i'm sure you guys are aware is a very legendary uk festival um you have to register to buy tickets beforehand register your, your pitch and all that malarkey and then tickets are kind of like staggered um uh staggeredly available throughout the year i think until the date of the concert and sometimes you can get them on resale whatever it's quite of a long process to get a ticket but in general there's a day reserved where they kind of first become available and everyone kind of tries to buy a ticket in my office there were maybe 10 to 12 people and i'm sure in offices around the uk or places around the world or maybe around the most of the uk i had people who were at off at, at my office waiting around until 7 p.m trying to buy their ticket online right um, some of them were successful, some of them weren't successful, but people made the sacrifice of staying at work, right, outside of their working hours, an hour extra, just to kind of secure tickets. They made the effort to save money, right, because it was in the middle of the month, so some people might have, some people who paid to paycheck had to have saved some money beforehand in order to kind of um, do that, right, They're, so good or sound financial planning needs to go into that decision. So people who did all that kind of stuff showed by their actions that they care a lot about Glastonbury and they were going to make any a, a, any and all adjustments needed in order to kind of secure their tickets. And they did it. So the whole idea that people can't do certain things because they don't have the money or don't have the thing or don't have X, Y, and Z is a bit of an excuse and a bit of an easy cop-out. But what really needs to be asked or the things that you really need to kind of battle with or you really need to kind of like question is how much you're willing to sacrifice, right? And this kind of goes back to the quote that I just read in The Movable Feast by Ernest Hemingway. The idea of like, you have to sacrifice one thing or the other, especially if you're not rich. If you have all the disposable income needed, which is why it's called disposable income, because you can, you know, you can dispose of more of it in different places. If you don't have dispos loads of disposable income, you have to prioritize what you buy, the, um, the things that you do the places that you go, right? You have to do that. And I think 
that's the hardest question people have to kind of face up with. What am I going to sacrifice in order to go where I want to go to, in order to kind of achieve my dreams or buy that jacket or buy that handbag? You have to sacrifice something. You have to be willing to sacrifice. And once you've done it, just see it through. But the idea that you don't have the time or you don't have the resources to do something is a lie. You can save up and get whatever you want to get. It's going to take longer, especially if you're not being paid a, uh, a good base salary, right? It might take a bit longer than it would somebody else that maybe is paid double what you're on. But you can get the thing that you want if that's what you really, really want. You can make the adjustments. And people do it all the time without realizing. They suck, they, you know, like people who smoke and don't have money, right? But you're still smoking. So you, you always find a way to buy cigarettes one way or the other and cigarettes aren't cheap right they're not necessarily the most expensive thing in the world but not necessarily 20 pence right they're i don't know 10 pound and upwards whatever they may be plus the lighter that you're gonna have to buy um incrementally every few months whatever it may be right so you have to continually continually do those sacrifices so you have to continue do make those sacrifices in life but it's quite important as well to t let yourself know that you're making those sacrifices and be honest about where you are and what you're trying to achieve as opposed to kind of like kidding yourself. And that's the kind of quote, that's what kind of brought to mind the quote and why it struck home to me reading A Movable Feast. I'm kind of halfway through reading at the moment. I can't wait to finish this set now. But yeah, it's a great little book um, to be reading right now, especially in the place that I am in my life. And this time anyway, it's really speaking to me. But yeah, that was it. Anyway, moving on to some subjects because I've been rambling on about other things that have to do with the subject. But yeah, let's go. So, Number one, today's world is uh, World Mental Health Day. I've seen on in social media, everyone's posting loads of interesting and cool things or really insightful, inspirational, motivational articles and, you know, sharing their experiences with mental health and all that malarkey. And I'm happy and glad that people are talking about it because, you know, in some places you hear of people saying there is a taboo or it's still a bit, you know, it's still a bit um, controversial or it's not something that's widely accepted. But I think for the most part, especially with social media, especially with this fucking com um, phone that I have in my hand, I think there is, a, there is more of an acceptance that mental health issues, especially nowadays, are a real thing, right? I think maybe before people might have thought of it like cyberbullying, right? Where it's like... Uh, where cy people think of cyberbullying as like, you know, you could just turn off your computer and like leave it alone right so they don't necessarily think it's a real thing but i'm sure there are kids out there who would argue against it, especially the ones that have been suffering from cyberbullying but you know mental health is maybe had the same sort of stigma people don't necessarily believe it's a real thing but i think with you know with loads of companies especially with google's announcements of the pixel the other day they announced that they're going to have um a health a wellness part of the google software that's going to allow you to track the amount of time that you spend on social networks uh, like most companies are doing that apple did it with the release of the new iphone too everyone's kind of making uh, a pivot towards kind of health and wellness and trying to make sure that people are not you know overly exposed to um social media the internet and able to kind of detach themselves from it and able to engage in the real world that they're living at the moment right and not have themselves all wrapped up around their um twitter firestorms that they're creating for themselves um that ha that's happening now so there's a, a lot more of a, a realization or an acceptance that maybe this mental health thing is real and maybe it's something that does affect a lot more people than you'd hope than you'd first assumed but there's a caveat to this right And the caveat to it is that as um, there needs to, hmm. obviously we've seen the backlash about the whole mental health um, hustle at the moment because there's been a lot of YouTubers who have been promoting this um, service called BetterHelp, right? Which effectively allows you to see a psychiatrist over the internet, right? Via, via phone call, I think, or via Skype call, right? So you can do things via, so be a bit, be a basically your phone. You don't need to like go into an actual um office or an actual building or leave your home to kind of like see someone and speak about your mental health issues or to kind of like guide you through the whole kind of process whatever it may be um better health promotes their service in a really shady way they don't necessarily if you have to read the fine print they basically say it's an admit ad, 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 addendum right an accessory to going and seeing an actual psychiatrist right but they do kind of promote it as a as an alternative to seeing a psychiatrist so there's kind of some conflicting messaging going on there but quite a lot of youtubers have kind of like you know taken the paycheck and the kind of referral fee that comes from signing up with better health and they've been promoting it on a lot of their videos and um pewdiepie the other day released a video um kind of like bashing it or kind of you know criticizing 
this idea that you can get um, valuable um, psychiatric help by uh, via your phone, via using a webcam, whatever. Maybe you're using the the front facing camera on your phone, right? So there is a there are some charlatans that have come into the space and obviously seen an opportunity because everyone's talking about mental health, right? And that's the thing that kind of was annoying me in the beginning when I kind of saw the whole mental health movement um, spreading online for the most part, right? Was that when I say online, like it was <laughs> this is fucking weird though. Must be the water's getting to my head, man, getting fucked up. But um, that's what really annoyed me about the whole mental health message being spread online because it felt as if, for me, it felt as if there was there was too much, there was a little bit too much going, there was a little bit, too much wallowing in the idea that you are suffering from mental health and there was a little bit too many there was too many people talking about mental health at the same time and i didn't think and i was a bit dubious of the of the, in, the intentions the motives and whether or not it was legitimate or not right there was too many people coming out saying they had mental health issues and a lot of the people that were coming out saying they had mental health issues were people that were of the similar age group that i am in right where it may be in a similar kind of uh were in a similar kind of place in their kind of overall career, um, were maybe in a similar sort of place in terms of how they view themselves mentally, right? So those kind of things, if I take the, if I kind of be, if I kind of can self-criticize myself or be a little bit hard on myself, I'd say a lot of those kind of pieces of self-doubt that I have about my own place in life, about where I am, about the things that I have done, the things that I haven't done, can maybe i could easily say that i suffer from mental health issues too right because i don't feel confident at times um sometimes um i feel as if i haven't done enough sometimes i feel as if i should be doing more sometimes i feel as if i've been a failure blah 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 blah. there are things that i could easily prescribe to mental health right but i don't i just i just see it as a as a um, as a consequence of living on social media having to spread my work and kind of communicate and to kind of like spread my message or promote my personal brand on social media leads you to kind of compare a lot right there's a good quote here actually about um about comparing right in the it doesn't have to be hard it doesn't have to be crazy at work and it's by mark twain and it says uh mark twain says um comparison is a death of joy right and that's true right because but with the death of joy it does come some sort of you know depression or mental health issues too Especially when you're comparing yourself on the feed every fucking millisecond, right? You're kind of like every square that you're loading up on your screen is basically a way for you to compare your current situation. Especially when it's during the summer months when people are going to festivals or um, when it's during the winter and people are going to Art Basel, Miami and shit, right? You're, you're, you're like getting this FOMO. You're seeing, you're not seeing yourself there. It's kind of another, it's another, um, it's another reminder of how far away you are, blah, 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 blah. They, that can lead you to kind of assuming you have mental health issues. When by and large, it's a consequence of living your life on social media, right? Um, is that you've got, you're constantly comparing yourself because you're living on social media. But that necessarily mean you don't, that doesn't necessarily mean you have quote unquote mental health issues. I think maybe there needs to be in the same way, you know, as the Me Too movement progresses and the whole, um, yeah, as a whole mental health Me Too movement progresses, there will, there, there, there will be, there will be a tier or there will be a category um, where you kind of can put some forms of sexual assault, right? Not all forms of sexual assault are the same. I know Matt Damon got pillars of saying that, but you know it's it's quite it's quite easy, it's quite it's quite um, obvious to say that you know rape isn't the same as a guy kind of like wandering his hand down a girl's back uninvited. They're both unwarranted. No one wants to be raped, right? No one wants to, if you didn't ask for a guy to draw his hand down the arch of your back that's not warranted either but they have to they have to, in the same way that they receive different punishment they have to be dealt with differently too um so the same could be said for mental health issues right people with actual mental health issues in terms of not actual but you know your conventional mental health issues the ones that we're more aware of nowadays in terms of depression and stuff maybe can be dealt with differently than people who are going through kind of quarter life crises because they are not where they need to be in their in their career now that, that's not to diminish the in, the kind of how it impacts you right you can still be quite sad and quite cut up and um quite depressed and quite down about where you are in terms of your professional career but it needs to be dealt with in a different way right it needs to be addressed differently and again it needs to be more solutions offered up in terms of how you can kind of combat it 
um, at the moment you're seeing a lot of um, you're seeing a lot of um, startups or a lot of companies, a lot of software companies, hardware companies like Apple and stuff, kind of you know allowing you to track the amount of times you're spending on these social networks. But I don't think that's enough still, right? There needs to be more education around like how to how to active how to use these things like tools. Because I don't believe in there's some people that got OTT. They're like, oh, I'm gonna keep my phone to my friend and tell them to lock it up in the safe and not give back to me until I until I finish my book. Like, grow up, yeah, be a grown up. Just use it. Like an adult, it's a phone. Use it like an adult. So there, there is a time to like use it. Use it like a computer game, like how you how you'd give an iPad to a kid, right? There is a time for you to play on the iPad. There's also a time for you to do your homework. And I think we have to go back to being adults again, right? And being able to use this without having to give it to a friend and lock into a safe somewhere because we can't uh, keep our fingers off Twitter. Um, so there needs to be more education in that in that sense. But what you don't need to do is what Pierce Morgan did, right? And it made me just think in general about you know being being a contrarian. For the sake of being a contrarian. Um, I guess if you're Piers Morgan, maybe, you know, it's, it's part of your brand and that's what pays the bills. That's why you're on um, Good Morning. Is it Good Morning or that show he's on in, um, on, on ITV? That's why you get hired to do these kind of shows because you are that person that isn't afraid to say what's on their mind. You know, that kind of fucking nonsense shit, right? Friend of a friend of Trump and all that sort of malarkey. Pull yourself up, be a bootstrap sort of dude. So that kind of message he likes to go up. But... In the in the you know in an era that we're living in now and how sensitive people are, it you have to know when you press send tweet that you're gonna absolute create an absolute shitstorm. So everyone's talking about World Mental Health Day and how you know um, what they've the battles they've gonna go through and how you shouldn't be afraid to reach out and speak to somebody and you know all these really lovely heartfelt messages are being appearing on social media and our guy Piers fucking Morgan decides to do decides to say this right decides to send out this to this fucking beauty of a tweet right it's like bloody hell what a crazy dude right i think it's time to change the language on mental health let's start using the, the phrase mental strength and teach our kids the power of resilience as if right mental health had to had meant the way to combat mental health was just to be more resilient get stronger right like um what do you think called stiff upper lip um suck it up it reminds me of the song by idols that's out at the moment that they've been forming a few times um um, I'm a boy and I like to cry. Da, 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 da. Let me see if I can find it. But this song really, really kind of describes, you know, is a good antidote to kind of this whole machismo attitude that um uh where is it? Love song, what's it called? Cry to me, what's the one? I'm scum? No, it's not that one. Is it Colossus? Love song. Is that? No. I'm a boy and I like to cry. What is the song? It's about idols. Is that that one? June? It says June. No, it's not June. Is it Samaritans? Maybe Samaritans, yeah? Yeah, that's the one. It's Samaritans. Okay, let me get the lyrics up for Samaritans. So, I just got this song called Samaritans, which is a real good antidote to all this shit that fucking, um, this tweet that this donut Piers Morgan has been saying at the moment, right? So, Samaritans um, by Idols. You should really check it out, right? Great, great little band. So it says that. So the um, here's Samarit Here's a quote. Here's the the lyrics of Samaritans, right? Man up, sit down, chin up, pipe down, socks up, don't cry, drink up, just lie. Grow some balls, he said. Grow some. Man up, sit down, chin up, pipe down, socks up, don't cry, drink up, don't whine, grow some balls, he said, grow some. The mask, the masculinity is a mask, a mask that's wearing me. Which is effectively what this is, isn't it, right? It's an it's a kind of an old day to like anti masculinity, right? This idea that you have to mental health is mental strength. Mental health is mental strength. It's just like, like what the fuck are you talking about? Being able to admit, being able to come come out and say you're struggling with mental health issues is one step in towards mental strength. But you don't need to tell people in the in the wake of them trying to, you know make people more comfortable in order to speak out loud about mental health issues they're struggling to, to be more mentally, mentally strong. It's just like, come on, dude. Anyway, it continues. Um, uh, this song by Idols called Samaritans. I'm a real boy, boy and I cry. I like myself and I want to try. This is why you never see your father cry. Um, and it continues on. I'm a real boy, boy, I like, I, I'm a real boy boy and i cry i love myself and i want to try 
Um, yeah, I kissed a boy and I liked it. It's a fucking real hegemony, real fucking um, headache for people that are, you know, prescribed to the idea of masculinity being, oh, I can't kiss lad, or I can't cry, I can't be emotional. Put your guard down and let people know you're suffering from mental health issues. But also, you know, let's progress the conversation a little bit. Let's, let's take it a bit further than just... Um, analyzing how much time we're spending on social media apps and maybe come with some concrete solutions to help um, the millennials of this generation because I think, you know, this will impact more not even millennials, it will impact more the generation uh, below millennials, right? Coming up who are living their life entirely on social media. I used to live my life on the internet, right? On, on forums and stuff and blogs, whatever, but these kids are living entirely on social media networks or apps uh, by by and large, right? I'd love to see, I'd love to I'd love to see the usage of like a 15 year old, right? A smart, the smart thing is a 15 year old. I, I bet some of them don't even use Safari. Like I bet you, I bet you it's just like all apps. They spend entire, all their time on apps, whether it's Snapchat, WhatsApp, iMessage, um, Instagram, Facebook. I bet it's all just apps. It's not even, they don't even spend none of it on Safari. Whereas I spend quite a lot of time on the actual internet. I mean, like reading articles and shit because I'm an old fuck or because I'm, you know, whatever it may be, I have, I have my own um, interests. But I would love to see that kind of usage data for a 15 year old. I bet it would be really, really interesting. And those are the people that need, those people that need to see us being more upfront about mental health issues, but also dealing with it in a mature and adult way and not just wallowing in the fact that we have, um, we're suffering from a quarter life crisis, right? And not prescribing that's mental health, but actual giving us, giving ourselves an, op- an, op- an opportunity to kind of grow and learn from it. As opposed to just like, you know, celebrating the fact that we have something wrong with us. Because I don't know, it just, it, just, it just kind of irked me a bit. You know, there's too many people coming out at once, all kind of singing the same chorus that so they have mental health issues. Like, I don't know if you all have the same thing or if there's a different kind of thing that you all have, but maybe under, under the same umbrella. I don't know. What do I know? I'm just a normal boy from Stratford trying to make sense of the world. But anyway, I saw that tweet and I was just like, I wonder if Piers Morgan has a team of people who kind of sit around and look at the most, you know, popular beliefs that people have, right? And kind of and kind of and just try and be contrarian as they can possible uh, about that popular belief. Try and think of the opposing view and just throw it up there and just start a firestorm. Because you have to know if you're Piers Morgan that you're just gonna light social media up on fire. You're gonna be the guy that everyone's gonna cast. It's probably I'm I'm assuming this is probably gonna be a talking point for their Good Morning Britain show they're gonna do later on. Do you know what I mean it all serves kind of a thing? They're gonna work that into the kind of show. Oh, you've been getting a lot of tweets, a lot of backlash, and people saying, no, 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 no. I'm sure it's gonna be part of it, but. It must be tiring as fuck being that person. But then I guess motivation wise or people have that people like it's like Chrissy Teigen in the same way, right? She loves getting into Twitter spats with people or being controversial about things, right? Oh, I don't I think man is overrated. Um argue, whatever. Do you know that kind of thing? It's that kind of um But it must be tiring. I could never be that person, man. I just it just takes too much time in a day to be constantly going back and forth with people or to be consistently having that energy being brought towards you. Like, do you know I mean? I'm not talking about that fucking Kanye West Trump hat energy, but you know, just in general, that energy coming towards you at breakneck speed all the time is a can be it just can be too much, I reckon. And and that's a mental health issue. Do you know what I mean for sure? The person has to continually be the firebrand, right? The 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 Kate Hopkins of the world, right? Um, imagine what she has to go through day, and day again. Maybe they just enjoy it, but fucking hell, man! Chill out, man! Chill out. What else is on the topic here? Uh, la, la, la. Did anyone go to Hype Fest? I want to know because I've seen nothing on social about it. Even people that actually went, I've seen nothing. I've seen some people. I've seen a couple of. The kind of like street style influencers posting pictures of their outfits, right? People standing in front of cars wearing colorful outfits. I'm looking at you, bloody Osiris, right? Bloody O. Um, which is always funny, isn't it? When you see those pictures of um, style influencers or outfit influencers standing in places, dressed what, in what they're dressing, and then people in the comments replying underneath the picture saying, Oh, I'm so proud of you. Proud? Proud that they're wearing clothes. Uh, what? Huh? Come again? You're proud that he's got an outfit on? Okay, great outfit. I love that proud that proud of shirt. That collection was great. Um, do you know? Like, okay, mutual proud is a genius. The way you put that together, sick. Ah, cool, cool comments. Still not gonna say that, right? On social media, but to say you're proud of someone because they're wearing clothes, huh? What? It's fucking nuts, but that's what I've seen, right? Content-wise, on online, I've just seen people talking about. 
I've seen people posting pictures of what they wore, but I'm not seeing any content. There were, there were still panel discussions. There were little people, there were people doing shows and shit, right? I'm assuming. Um, I'm sure Jeff Staple did a, a Hype Beast Talks thing, a Business of Hype, whatever he does, right? Podcast. Um, I'm sure there were other things going on, but I've not seen anything. Um, which makes me wonder, was this just a one big cash grab for Hype Beast to make more money? Or was it an opportunity for them to kind of flex their branding muscles and show advertisers just how much pull they actually have, right? Because it's all well and good sending an advertiser a deck of the reach you can get, the engagement, um, views, all that sort of malarkey. But when you can say you're a company like Hypebeast, who, I don't know, let's say you generate, let's say you're able to generate 50 million views a month, whatever it may be, right? Let's, I just, arbitrary number, arbitrary uh, duration of time. And let's say you're able to say, okay, cool, watch this. And you're able to say, we organized this, this event within a month. We announced it, uh, I don't know, three weeks before the event was going to drop. And we got X amount of people to come to this um, random place in the middle of Brooklyn. That's like, whoa. Do you know what I mean? If you're advertising, like, shit, that's some real brand kind of like influence. That's some real brand power. So maybe it was a way for them to do that. But I don't know, man. If you're high piece and you spend all that money, they, they got some big people to perform, some big people to come and fly down. Like, I've booked people from panel discussions, right? Working at Masters. I've done a streetwear program led by Virgil Abloh. I've, I've booked these people. I've booked these people to speak at my panel discussions. I know it's not fucking cheap. I can tell you that. It's not peanuts. So to get them to fly down, to put them in a hotel, to pay their fucking appearance fee, like, to get, you know what I mean? To get them dinner and shit, um, Ubers back and forth from where they're going to go to. It's not cheap, so... I can't imagine they just did all the branding and stuff, but maybe they do have that much disposable income or maybe that what they're going to get in the back end is going to be so much more than what they had to outlay in the front end. But I've, again, I've not seen anything online. All I've seen for the most part are these like recaps of people's outfits and shit, which are boring as fuck, right? But that's what I've seen for the most part. I've not seen anything else online of people talking about the actual event itself, right? Um, I've got this up on the screen now. So if you guys are watching on YouTube, you could see it. But it's a recap, right? Hype Beast recap. Culture and community came together at last, which is funny, you know, to say that. But, you know, it must be an interesting proposition to put together anyway, right? Like, what's the point? You have to think of it, right? Like, what's the point? Hype Beast doesn't necessarily have a good community culture anyway, right? I think Complex probably has a better community culture because it kind of attracts the quote unquote fuckboys, right? And they don't mind calling themselves fans of Complex, but you don't necessarily. There's not necessarily that much pride in calling yourself a hype beast reader or calling yourself a quote unquote hype beast. It doesn't necessarily it's not something that you want to associate yourself that strongly with. You want to use it as a platform, but it's not necessarily it's not New York Times, right? Of streetwear. It's not necessarily that kind of platform. Whereas Complex has more of a even though it's a bit corny and it's a little bit um it's a little bit it's a little bit vanilla, right? There's not much substance to it. Um, it seems as if most of the articles they put up on Complex are just like devoid of any sort of debt for value, right? Um, a bit clickbaity, but they have got their opportunity. They have got a bit more of a blank canvas to kind of like people can put their names towards a Complex Con easier. Like I would be more comfortable talking at Complex Con than I would be at Hype Fest. Like I don't even though I used to work for Hype Beast back in the day. I was one of the first writers when it first launched, right? One of the contributing writers on there, right? Back in the days, I would still be more comfortable to be associated with Complex Con and Hype Fest because I wouldn't want to be known as anyone that had anything to do with hype. Same way, maybe some people wouldn't want to be known as anyone's anything to do with anything to do with Complex, but it's, I don't know. It's a bit weird, isn't it? Like why you'd want to do it? I guess again, if you're a brand, it makes more sense to so associate yourself with Hype Beast because they've got the fucking kids in the palm of their hands, right? Um, that whole culture, you, that whole com market, if you want to tap into it, there's only one place you need to go to or there's only a couple places that you can go to. But I think as a as a, as a a reader of the site, why would you go to this thing? Like what, to stand around and see people's outfits? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. It's not something, again, maybe I'm talking out of turn here. There's some cool things, you know, seeing this image of um, Virgil's off-white collaboration with Rom Romoa Luggage, which looks really cool, kind of going around a kind of like Lourish carousel. Um sakai did so loads of little pop-up shops are there so i guess again maybe it's a chance for you to sell shit right if you're if you're a brand if you're a, a an influencer if you're a personal brand if you're a retailer it might be a good opportunity to kind of like showcase um your merchandising skills your current your uh, maybe it might be a chance to kind of flex your design skills and kind of like create a one-off capsule collection that you can kind of put out there there's loads of things you can go around in and do but it's it, what is it just a trade show which with shops and retailers and brands in there instead of people selling to actual shops and retailers maybe 
um, you know, Fragment did some exclusive stuff that they sold at Hype Fest. I was getting. It's just interesting. It's just interesting why anyone would want to go to a thing like this. Um, maybe some workshops, maybe. I've seen here with Adidas did a couple of workshops where you could maybe stitch, what are these, NMDs? You could maybe edit, you could maybe um, make your own custom NMDs and then maybe the same vein that Virgil did is off-white collaboration with a little bit more cutty and pasty, a little bit more stitchy and less kind of colorway changing. CP Company had a thing there. Not sure if that's Linda Farrow glasses. I'm not sure what glasses those are. Um, Alex did a collaboration too with Nike, which looks pretty good to be honest. Those high, those Air Force Ones looks insane. So an Air Force One high, I'm assuming with some sort of luxury fabrics, or it might be the um, the SWAT team. Is it the tactical Air Force One? It might be that silhouette. And then the strap is the Alex belt, which is fucking insane, which is really, really cool that they've done that. It's nice how he's got his little design code with the belt, right? A little trademark that he's kind of um, been able to iterate out and kind of, you know, he's lent, he's lent that he's lent that over to Kim Jones, uh, Dior, and now he's kind of lending that same aesthetic to Nike, which is kind of cool to see. Um, what's this again? Is this more Alex here? Yeah? Or is it more Alex? Yeah, more, more, no, more Sakai here doing again midnight studios had a little pop again it looks a lot like a trade show if you've ever been to bread and butter have you been to agenda or you've been to bright trade show you see the same sort of thing right um maybe this is more like cap this is more like a this is more of a cheap way to do a pop-up shop right pop-up shop you're relying heavily on attracting bringing your own audience to the physical space but if you're a brand and midnight studios you can basically st- kind of like steal customers from different brands because they kind of walk past your booth and see, oh, yeah, I mean, that's just, so you get a lot more passing traffic in that respect. So it kind of be a, a little bit more of a cheat code in order to kind of hack the kind of pop-up culture space that's been maybe a little bit over flooded at the moment and maybe is a bit more risky. Um, again, uh, there's some cool stuff that maybe, oh, Lacoste did uh, use that machine, right? That um, the DDT machine, the kind of the, the gun that you can use to kind of print on garments, which is interesting. Polo are kind of attracting that kind of aesthetic. They've got some airbrush t-shirts in the back there. I wonder who's doing, I wonder who's doing the, um, the creative director. Who's the new creative director for Lacoste? Because they've already got, they've got, they've, they've done that cool collaboration with um, Supreme recently, right? Those tracksuits, they look really, really fucking good. And they're really making a they're really making a, a real strong pivot towards the youth market, it seems at the moment, and tapping into what's kind of con- currently going on in the culture. They're really taking that brand and kind of trying to modernize it a little bit more. It doesn't look as stiff as it did previously. And you know, things like airbrushing tees and digitally printing on stuff and heat pressing um, logos and stuff is a cool way to do about it. But again, would I go to this just to do that? Uh, what, how much were tickets? What fifty fifty to hundred dollars? I'm assuming, right? I don't know, man. It's just I don't I don't know what the point is of these things, you know. Again, you got the art people coming in down. You got Andre. I don't know. In two thousand eighteen, do you want to see Andre drawing his stick figures with big hats on again in a, in a space? Again, maybe because I'm talking about because I'm a bit older and I've seen it all before. Maybe if you're a kid coming up, but if you're a kid coming up, do you do you keep do you want to keep seeing Takeshi Murakami artwork again and again and again, or do you want to see? someone new and fresh being promoted in the scene and brought up because i guess that's that's where uh, that's where we miss aaron bondaroff or someone like that right he's kind of been he's kind of been ostracized from the scene since the sexual alleg- sexual assault allegations kind of came out but we need someone in the scene that kind of can o- occupy that space is able to kind of promote new artists or especially new artists in the conventional sense because we're not really getting that many of them really in it when you go on hype beats, you still see the same old people being regurgitated, right? Takeshi Murakami, Andre, Jomiso, Basquiat, Banksy. It's the same super group of people, but where are the new voices? Where are the new people kind of being um, spoken about? You don't really see them on hype beats. Like the girl that designed um, the cover for I Love It, I think, by um, Kanye West and Lil Pump. She did kind of like a Kenny Marshall sort of like as, um, inspired artwork for the piece. Like some of like that needs to be promoted a little bit more, right? There's more artists out there that need to be promoted, that like contemporary, uh, modern day kids of the now that should be kind of like held it up as the new Andres or the new Andre or the new future Futura 3000s. But again, what do I know? Um, talking about Futura, there he is, the man of myth, a legend. But it needs to be, there must be some new blood out there that they can kind of promote a little bit because, you know, Akira being brought up again, what, because of the Kanye conversation recently where he said it was his favorite movie of all time and he went to Japan to or Tokyo to go meet the director. I don't know, man. I don't know. It's all a bit samey, isn't it? It's like you see all this stuff on the internet and they just put it in a room, right? There's no real, un- the only unique experience you're going to, I see the only USP I see on this in going to these kind of events is maybe the products, right? You can kind of, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're someone with a hustler mindset, you could go there, queue up and flip all the shit that they're selling in there, right? 
Um, but again, everyone's doing, everyone's got the same idea. So the value of the thing kind of diminishes, especially if you're not quick on the, on the resale tip, if you're not quick to kind of get it up on there. The price is sort of like level out after a period of time. Or if you're somebody that wants to participate or wants to become the next Heron Preston, you can sit down and hear them talk, right? In, in during panel discussions, whatever, if you want to meet a Jonah Hill, whatever, he was there or whatever, you can do that. But I guess that's the only USP of going to these kind of things, like going and hearing Hiroshi Fujiwara and, um, Matthew Williamson, but Matthew Williams from um, Alex and stuff, or Alex talking, right? That's the only, that's the only real, that's the only real benefit I can see from going to something like this, right? That the old, that makes the cost of entry worth it, right? Action Bronson at the other desk place as well, doing things. Apart from that, it's all a bit, it's a bit shit. It look, I don't know. I know I was optimistic about it previously, but I don't know it's a bit shit. It doesn't really. It doesn't really look like something you'd you'd want to go to again. Apart from being in a room, I think where's this dude from again? So that's, in the picture we have Jeff Staple and the, I think that's John Elliott, right? So Jeff Staple, John Elliott, Nigel Shivesta, and Hiroshi Fujiwara. So hearing those four guys talk about how they made it in the industry or tips and advice for people that want to become personal brands. In the case of Nigel Silvestre, has been able to kind of pivot his BMXing career into a fucking Jordan brand shoe, which has been a bit weird in general, right? wherever it may be, so be it. But, you know, that idea of like taking, you know, fusing BMXing and wearing Jordans, you know, has been something that he's been able to really sustain really well. And he's kind of been able, he's been kind of one of the four forerunners in terms of, you know, being a personal brand in the whole BMX community, Hiroshi Fujiwara, the less said the better. John Elliott is obviously someone that's very well um, regarded in the kind of New York menswear or US menswear scene in general. Uh, someone that Kanye has a lot of time for as well because he's creating this kind of new, kind of like um, the new American, uh, the new kind of like Ralph Lauren, right, for the modern day man. At the moment, obviously, Jeff Staple, someone that everyone has a lot of time for. So that could be the real, the real value for admission. But apart from that, why would you go to something like this? It's a bit shit, isn't it? And that's why probably I'm not seeing any content. But again, I think videos of people walking in and out. I think little interviews with people attending the shows. Uh, snippets of the interviews or from the panel discussions. Previews of up and coming items that haven't been released yet. There's so much content that could have been put out from this. But I haven't seen anything. I don't even think they have a dedicated Instagram. Like I've just seen stuff, recap images like this I'm showing on screen. And I've also seen stuff like this. Um, fucking street style pictures of people standing around them um, showing their outfits and stuff. Again. I don't know what's going on. You see people art, right? A recap of the art. And I think there's one about street style. Where's the street style one? The shoe snap, which I don't have any time for. But there's people standing around with their outfits, which has been really funny. But hey, again, I don't know. Did, did people go to street hype fest? Am I assuming things? Was it one of the best festivals that ever existed? And I just wasn't there to see it happening. And you had to be there in order to believe it. But a big part of festivals nowadays, especially if you want returning customers, in the same way that Primavera do, in the same way that Coachella do, in the same way that Lovebox do, in the same way that Field Day, loads of other festivals do, is that you have to create really compelling content around the festival itself, around the event, in order for people that didn't go, like myself, to be like, oh my God, man, fear of missing out. I can't believe I didn't go to that. I'm definitely going to go next year. Right, you have to create that content that people can kind of think, oh my God, I really missed out. I really should have gone to this thing because X, Y, and Z happened. This didn't happen. But to go there and just see these dullards standing around posing in outfits and crouching and doing squats on the floor and shit, I'm not, I'm not really, I'm not really down. I, I got to be honest, man. I'm not down in the slightest. I just think it's a complete waste of time. Like, there'd be so many more beneficial things you could be doing with your time. I don't know. I don't know. Not for me. Not for me, dog. I'm, I'm, I think I'm set on this sort of thing. But again, maybe that's why I didn't see anyone's post about it because it was just an absolute clusterfuck of an, of an event. But yeah, um, maybe there's a bit more fine tuning needs to be done in order to kind of make these events, these kind of like streetwear, uh, these in real life streetwear events successful. Maybe needs a, a lot more work needs to be done via it because at the moment you just you just getting kids that will queue outside in front of a shop standing in and around a trade show with different brands with booths showing items that you might have already seen on the internet. It's a bit like, hmm, it's a bit strange. But what do I know? Next on the agenda, Fonica roll top record bag. Oh my days! Have you guys seen this? This is fucking cool. Um. Again, I've, I don't know why. I think because I've been reading or listening to a lot of interviews with a lot of Berlin, Berlin 
based uh, DJs who are kind of, you know, most of those guys, especially living in Berlin, because there's a high concentration of DJs, high concentration of bars and clubs, and a lot of people that do play vinyl in Berlin. So there's been a, a big conversation I've seen in general in the last few years of DJs kind of resorting back to playing on vinyl because, you know, it's the one thing that can separate the amateurs from the actual pro professionals, right? Because you have to actually go out there, buy records, you actually have to have a bit of an ear to kind of dig kind of find gems you kind of have to beat match or be able to mix and blend a little bit it does require more than just going online and um downloading the top 50 tracks from juno or whatever or whatever it may be right you need to have a little bit more of a you need to, it requires more effort right it's a bit more tactile it requires more effort and people generally don't want to do it because it's a bit more difficult. And plus, a lot a lot of clubs don't really have good vinyl setup, so it can be a bit sketchy to kind of get it to work. But I see a lot of movement towards it. And um, this is and I saw this bag from Fronica they just put out recently. They've got a backpack for you to carry your 12 inches and 7 inches in, which is, looks really fucking cool. So it's the same sort of vein as a roll top bag. You see guys carrying that, you know, those kind of roll top bags that are waterproof. Um, and the ones that kind of couriers have, right? So the same sort of style, sort of bag that you can kind of roll instead of having the zip and you can kind of, uh, it's got like a buckle as I'm showing you here on the image as you guys can see on the internet. So it's available now on Fonica. And it's only priced at 40 quid. So it's, it looks, the finishing isn't that great, right? I'm assuming that this is only V1. Um, I, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more attention to detail, right? It doesn't look as well finished as it could, could look. The buckle is a bit cheap. The zip doesn't look that, flattering the logo on the back is a bit bait right so it's a bit it's a bit finicky looking but i think i, I probably prefer it in the olive the olive looks quite cool like it's got it's got like um a dark green body with like a kind of a black bottom that looks quite nice right um and the logo doesn't look as disturbing as it does on the other on the other bags but overall it's a pretty interesting um it's a pretty interesting uh bag i quite like it maybe you wouldn't maybe it's not enough to have your entire set Maybe I don't know how much, how many individual vinyls you could carry in one bag. I'm not sure how much. How many, how many vinyls would you need for like an hour set minimum, or like an hour, to, a minimum two hour set? You might need a bit more than that, innit? I think so. I'm not too sure, but it's quite a cool bag, man. I quite like it. Um, I think it's quite cool for forty quid. It's, it's an absolute bargain, I reckon. And I'd get it, especially for, for especially in that olive color. It also comes in a blue. Or like a navy, it looks like, right? A navy body with a black bottom too. But yeah, the old black I'm not really a fan of. It looks a bit cheap, but I really like the olive green. So yeah, check out that. Fonica have got their own record bag. So Fonica roll top record bag. Um, yeah, really nice. 40 pounds in stock now. And I'll put the link in the show description so you guys can check it out yourself. Talking about DJs who DJ in vinyl, the next thing on the list is this. So um, there's this um, series on on youtube by a channel called Techno tele telecommunications electronic beasts i think it's a t-mobile thing but they do loads of like dj pacific content which i, I check from time to time um i think his website's like electronicbeats.com or something along those kind of lines it's really cool it's a it's very german pacific it's really concentrating a lot of the berlin scene and a lot of the german scene in general um but most of it most of it or the majority of it is um in english and stuff so there's no danger there but it's a really 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 cool interview um with a dj who i didn't know who she was previously to watching this uh called uh Cynthi. i'm sure for uh, use for the other audio files or heads out there i'll be like oh my god how can you don't know who Cynthi is but yeah i didn't know she's previously watching this video but it's a really really cool video um kind of highlighting this lady that's doing some really really cool work i'm gonna play a bit of it now so you guys can listen to it but i thought yeah i thought it was a really good video because it, it kind of illustrated just wasn't it kind of illustrated um um how random or how um how you can't necessarily tell somebody how to make it in electronic music right what needs to be done there is no one way there's no one set method like, i'm so, that's why i see so many parallels in electronic music underground electronic music the uh, same um as that like, kind of stand-up comedy there's no one way to make it Yes, you can go to open mics and work your way up that way and then become a regular in the store somewhere and go that way. But for the most part, it, it takes just you fumbling around and then you just figure out a way um, for you to go. The same way with DJing, the same way with being a promoter, the same way with being a label head. There is no clear defined path like step by step in other professions that you ha might have, right? Where you go to school, where you become an intern, you do this. It's all, you just kind of have to figure it out. And this is a good example of it because this lady, Cynthia, is a label owner. She's a single mom. She has her own 
Um, she DJ. She has her own radio show. She has a full time job. It's an absolute insane amount of work that she does. But in the end, it all kind of like contributes and all kind of lends itself back to making her a much better DJ uh, or a really really good DJ because she gets booked in some of the biggest clubs around the world. And I really want to play this for you. So I'm going to put this on here and see if this works. Hopefully it does. But I'm going to put this on the screen. You guys can check it. And if you're listening to audio, you'll be able to listen to this nice and loud. Let me show this now here and play. had a big impact on me especially when I was younger because uh, yeah when I was 14 15 and I wasn't allowed to go out the only thing I could listen to this kind of music was through the radio or via the radio so um, yeah I find it very interesting to play records you don't necessarily play in your sets and you can be a bit more open and also I like to share music with people so that's why it's really important for me to have this radio show and but I have to say, when they offered me this show like two years ago, I was very surprised because I don't think my voice sounds very good. And uh, but I said, okay, you never try, you never know. And I tried it. My first radio show was horrible. I think I was talking too fast. I was so nervous. And um, yeah, but the second one, I felt really comfortable. And the more often I, I'm doing it, the more the easier it gets. Yeah, I love it. do everything myself is that uh, because I really love to be independent that means I uh, finance all the records myself I press all the records myself I um, finance all the merchandise myself and um, yeah I just like to have everything under control for me it's really hard to give some work to other people because I think if I do it myself it's done much better it sounds strange but it is like it is and we started that around seven years ago just because we all had so much music sitting on our computers and it was really hard for us to get the music out there to get heard and uh, no one was really releasing our stuff so that's why we started Best of Models then a few months later Diego Krause came up to me and he said look I have so much music I really want to release more what can we do and I was like okay let's just start a label just for you so that's um why we started Eunice and Wax for him and then of course after a while we got a lot of other demos sent by by some very close friends and we said okay we can't really release them on Best Modus because this is just for us for the core crew and but what about starting another sub label and then we started Best of Freunde which means best mates and uh, yeah it's really nice to also support other friends and other people and to improve the network also, uh, I run another label called We Are House. This is a bit more for the strip back kind of house music. And uh, yeah, and then just a few weeks ago, I started my own baby. It's called 803 Crystal Grooves. The 803 stands for the room number of my studio. And yeah, Crystal is my last name. So, And I decided to start a new baby because I'm going a bit more into like the disco direction. So that 
wouldn't have fit on any of the other labels and I said okay I just want to have one baby just for myself I want to be free independent do what I want and that's why I started a new label amazing right absolutely amazing and it goes it goes on to her doing her production as well in her own studio but absolutely amazing profile i recommend you check it out um i'm gonna link it again in the, in the show notes so you guys can check it out yourself but yeah simfy fucking personifying um working hard hustling and doing what you can to achieve your dreams man fucking absolute killer absolute fucking killer video highly recommend you check it out and you know what because it's one hour 23 i think i'm gonna end it right there because i've been waffling a bit too long there so 114 episode right thank you so much for tuning in my name is agostino um as you guys i'm sure are aware um i'll be djing this friday um at tapis for a night called tapped as i usually do from seven to half eleven or eleven ish depending on who's there um so if you want to hear some sweet sweet dj sounds from me then please visit my site, axinozinga.com. Click DJ Gigs and you can see a listings of where I'm going to play, locations, how to get there, and all that nice, beautiful stuff. And um, anything else concerning moi, you can also find that on my webby site. Um, I'll be seeing you guys again, I'm assuming, on Friday because I'm going to take a little break on a Friday. So I'm going to, no, on Thursday, yeah, I'll take a little break and I'll come back again on a Friday. So I'll be there for my third and last show of the week on Friday, trying to do three a week, if not two a week. But free is very, very manageable. Sober October continues. I'm still feeling fresh and feeling good. To this weekend is going to be a little bit more difficult than last weekend because I'm going to have two DJ gigs back to back. I'm going to play on the Friday and I'm playing on a Saturday and I'm working in between. So it's going to be a bit more difficult, but it should be better because if I'm sober, I should be able to DJ better. I should be able to be a bit more clear headed and wake up early and get my shift over. And I should be able to DJ well into the night. We early as the hours of the night on the Saturday evening. So it should work out better for me overall. But fingers crossed, fingers crossed pray for me that's all i'm asking pray for me as i pray for you but yeah this has been the agatino zinga show episode number 114 thank you so much for tuning in i hope you've had a great time as i have and i'm gonna see you guys again on the other side peace